There is nothing like Elevation Nights. And we have added three special summer dates. We are coming your way. Tell them where we're gonna be. I'm so excited about this. So on July 19th, we're gonna be in Savannah, Georgia. On July 20th, Greenville, South Carolina. And July 21st, Nashville, Tennessee, we're coming. Did you hear the lady? That's very soon. You gotta get your tickets right now so we can worship God, preach His Word. Everybody's coming. You better be there. I'll see you Elevation Nights. Here comes the Word of God. Go to elevationnights.com and get your tickets and then to the message. Let's hear the Word. I don't know how. Honestly, I'm flummoxed myself as to how I slid in to the DMs of Elevation. I don't know how. I'm shocked. I told Holly in the very beginning, I thought she got me confused with either Lisa Turkhurst, who sells a lot of books, or Lisa Bevere, who preaches in leather pants. And I thought, I know, but I can't. Or it sounds like ducks are being killed. There's a lot of squeaking if I preach in leather. And so I, I really don't know how, other than pure grace, that I get to be here. But I am absolutely delighted I do. There's there's not too many people I respect more than Pastor Holly and Pastor Stephen. Uh, I love Wade and Amy, uh, Chris, Colleen Tunis. There's just so many people at Elevation who have taught me, who have modeled for me uh, what running hard toward Jesus looks like, what it looks like to be enveloped in a family of faith. And so uh, before we dive into God's Word, let me get you to reach out and touch that saint next to you. This is not rhetorical. Go ahead and touch them. Don't grope them. Just touch them. Um, gentlemen, I know this is real girly, so y'all don't have to interlock fingers. You can just awkwardly pinky grip at this point. Um, those of you joining us online, uh, eFam, um, you don't have to touch anybody. Um, I hope you're in comfy pants. You can just undo the top button because this is a safe place to lean into Jesus. We want you to be comfortable. Would you pray for those saints on either side of you? If you're watching by yourself, pray for yourself and pray that in these next few minutes as we dive into this love letter called the Bible, that God will give us eyes to see bigger, ears that hear louder, and hearts that are pliant enough to actually receive the glorious good news that we have a perfect God who loves us unconditionally. We're the prize, y'all. We're the prize. Jesus, 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 thank you for this time and this space that we get to come together and focus our attention and our affection on you. Lord, we confess that most of us come with a lot of distraction. It takes me more, more than four or five songs to actually get my heart in a place to receive from you. Man, I wish worship had been an hour this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that promise that when we seek you with all our hearts, you will be found by us. But Jesus, I praise you even more so for that promise in Isaiah, the beginning of the book, where you say, so great is your love for us that you even reveal yourself to people who aren't looking for you yet. We're undone this morning by your kindness. God, just undone. We confess as your sons and daughters, we can't even understand Scripture apart from Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, just have your way in this place, in our hearts and our minds. Just um, plow up ground that's hard or numb or disappointed. Um, open our eyes. Lift our view beyond our circumstances so that we can remember this miraculous love story you, you wrote us into. We love you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Uh, we pray all these things in your perfect and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Speaking of, um, speaking of sliding into uh, Elevation's DMs, this is called uh, Body Glide. Um, it's a it's a stick. It's an anti-chafing balm. It's all all about getting yourself slippery. And I just wanted to start with TMI because um, I had to wear this the last time I was in a, an athletic competition. Um, I, I got talked into running a 10K. And um, even though I'm wearing Spanx this morning, it's probably very apparent that I'm not gifted at long distance running. Um, but a friend of mine talked me into it because she said, Lisa, they have this amazing swag. They have really cute t-shirts. 
Uh, this was in Colorado. And, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll line up with all these paleo people and I'll run this 10K because the t-shirts are really cute. And so before the race, she whipped out one of these body glide slides. And she said, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you know, you have such, um, such gifted legs that... <laughs> I think that it might help you to rub this on your inner thighs. Um, She did not say, or else you will be arrested for arson, but that was the implication. (laughs) And so I slathered myself up with body glide. Gentleman is like, what in the Sam Hill? We're getting to the Bible. We're gonna get there in just a second. So I'm all slathered up with body glide so I won't start a forest fire and the, and the starter's pistol goes off to start this race and I have Kodak courage. So I am up with the elite eight, like the first 200 yards of the race because everybody's cheering. But then it turns uphill and we start running up those gorgeous Rocky Mountains that were always meant to be skied down, not run up. I start running up those mountains and I thought, this is horrible. Who would do this as a hobby? Who would, I mean, I can understand if you were being disciplined or this was some kind of parole thing, but people do this on purpose. And so about halfway through the race, I was like, I I can't do this. I cannot do this anymore. This friction is too much. I have, I have what they call hot spots for, for runners. And so I thought I'm an old athlete. I played volleyball and tennis in college. And I thought I just can't bring myself to quit. That just seems sissy ish. And I can't do that, but maybe I could find a hole and I could step in a hole and break my ankle. And then I could. Step off this course with some some measure of dignity left. And so I'm searching for a hole on the race course. And all of a sudden I hear this really loud swishing sound behind me. And so I look over my shoulder and y'all, there's a six foot bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich beside me. You know how some people have so much energy when they run races that they actually wear costumes which I'm like, really, I'm, I'm like about to crawl and, and cry and, and knock somebody over the head who has a donut who's watching the race so I can take their carb. But instead, these people had enough energy to have a costume. The first guy had this massive foam cutout that was like Wonder Bread, just his face is poking through. Running shoes, just his face. Behind him is like this green tart piece of lettuce. It was very lifelike. Um, I wanted to eat it. Badly. And then he's roped to a middle runner. The middle runner, just his little face is poking out from a piece of lifelike American cheese. And then attached to that is three pieces of very wiggly bacon. I don't know what they made that out of. Then there's two other ropes uh, pulling up the caboose. He's a, another giant piece of Wonder Bread. And then he's slathered with all kinds of condiments and a life size tomato. Well, more than life size tomato. And I mean, it was really incredible. So creative, this giant six foot BLT and it was passing me. (laughs) And that is a lot of wind resistance. And so that was the lowest point of my competition. I decided never ever again would I compete in anything where I had to wear body glide. So I, I no longer compete in 10Ks. I don't rollerblade. I don't go to... Myrtle Beach, because because that particular vacation Mecca, there's a lot of people there who need body glide. It's a whole lot of rubbing going on up at Myrtle Beach. And um, I hope I haven't offended you Myrtle Beachers, but I was there recently and I just mentally, I couldn't handle that corporate need for, for some something to stop the chafing. Um, now, I don't know if running is your nemesis or if chafing is real for you, but I do know all of us can identify with feeling like we're not quite good enough for whatever activity we've stepped into that we don't quite meet the minimum requirement for some club, some community that we'd hoped to belong to. Feeling like we're not quite good enough, that's, that's not just an athletic competition thing, that's a human thing. Part of the human condition is to feel like we, we're just a little bit less than acceptable. Maybe it's that your mother-in-law always treated you like her boy could have done better. 
or maybe you're the only one who doesn't know how to pronounce Habakkuk in your E fam. Or maybe it's that you're in a double spanx kind of season and you hang out with a lot of keto girls. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about the human experience that presses on the bruise in our human psyche and causes us at some level to doubt, am I actually good enough for that? And the real, the real danger is when we superimpose that wondering if we're good enough onto the character of our creator, Redeemer. Um, it's the human experience to think we don't quite measure up. It is actually not biblically defensible. It's not in this divine love story we call a Bible. If you brought yours, turn to Genesis 48 and I'll prove it. Genesis 48, it's about a quarter of an inch from the beginning, unless you have a Schofield Bible, we'll have it up on the screens. Genesis 48, verse eight, and this is a long one, so don't play Angry Birds yet, I'll read fast. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Now, let me, let me qualify this just a minute because when you hear the word Israel, it, we forget that Israel is synonymous for Jacob. So this is one of the patriarchs in, in scripture, Jacob. So when I read Israel, I might just start changing it. I love you. I might just start changing it to Jacob because same, same name. Um, and um, Joseph, y'all remember who Joseph is? Y'all talk back, I'm not your pastor. <laughs> He's the guy who got this really cool colored coat from H&M and his brothers got all jealous and threw him in a hole, remember that? And then they dragged him off as a slave. He was in Egypt and then Pharaoh's wife was a total hoochie mama and she <laughs> accused him of sexual uh, uh, misconduct and he didn't do it, but he got thrown in jail anyway. Y'all remember this guy? And then he ends up being this great leader and God uses him to actually help his people not die of starvation during famine. Are you with me on the story? Okay, so we're at the part where he's done all that. He's a grown man. He has children of, of his own. And he goes back to Jacob, the patriarch, with two little boys, his two little boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born in Egypt, not in Israel. And so his dad, Jacob, the granddaddy of these little boys, uh, Joe says to him, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Jacob were dim with age so that he could not see. So he had cataracts. And uh, Jacob, so Joe brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Jacob said to Joe, I never expect to see your face. Because remember, they've been separated since his hateful brothers threw him in the pit and all. He says, I never expected to see your face. I never expected this reconciliation. I never expected you to come back to me, but God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. He's so delighted to bring his boys to his father. And Joe took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near him. And Jacob stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, if you've got a brick and mortar Bible and you're comfortable writing in it, underscore that, hugely significant, even for us as modern day Christ followers, we'll get there in just a second, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joe and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys, and in them let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers, Abe and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joe saw that his dad laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joe said to his daddy, not this way, dad, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know I might have cataracts, but I'm not stupid. That's not literal Hebrew, it's more message point two. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So, so Jacob blessed them that day saying, bless you. Israel will pronounce blessings saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joe, behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. So what does that Old Testament history 
mean to us today? Why is it significant for us, especially for those of us who wonder how in the world could a perfect God like that fully accept, fully love a damaged woman, a damaged man like me? First of all, in this ancient culture, they practiced the law of primogeniture. And that just means the firstborn got everything. Firstborn son got everything. The law of inheritance was the firstborn son was it. Second really was just a spare. First is the heir, second is a spare. And so what would happen is the patriarch of any family uh, community would bless the firstborn with his right hand. Because in Semitic culture, the right hand is the blessed hand. The right, right hand is the holy hand. The right hand is, is the, the hand that you want to bless with. Left hand is considered subservient. I was just in Israel again in March. And none of my Jewish friends will greet me with their left hand. That's considered disrespectful. The right hand is the hand of blessing. That's why you will never read in Scripture that Jesus sat at the left hand of God the Father. Always the right, always the right. So when, when Joe, multicolored coat guy, brings his two little boys to their granddaddy and he says, I want you to bless them, dad. And then Jacob crosses his arms. Y'all, this is the only time that happens in all of scripture. That's called a hapax legomenon. Isn't that cool? Share that with your EFAM group if they're thinking you're sliding. Just go, well, I was reading a hapax legomenon. It's a fancy word that means it only happens once in a corpus or in a text. You will never read this again in scripture. This is the only time you've got a patriarch crossing his arms intentionally to bless the second son instead of the first, as was their custom, as was their tradition. Joseph is so flustered by it. He's like, dad, you messed up. You blessed the wrong kid. And he goes, no, I knew exactly what I was doing. He says, here's the deal, Joseph. I want both of them blessed. What this leads to, scholars, critical scholars, call this etiology, fancy word that means this is, this is the foundation that explains what happens later on. This is the causation of something. This explains why Ephraim, who was the second son, becomes prominent in Israel's history. From, from, from then on, from Genesis 48, when you hear about Manasseh, he's firstborn, it says Manasseh and Ephraim. You would think they were twins by the way you read them in biblical narrative. And then Ephraim actually kind of gets bigger than Manasseh. Ephraim is the one where we get a lot of the leaders from in the Old Testament. Ephraim is the one when Israel splits into two nations. Y'all remember when that happened? Because we had Solomon, third king of Israel, and he was a player and had way too many wives and concubines and they fought and they couldn't decide for an heir. Do y'all remember this? And so it was real Jerry Springer. And so instead of Israel being one, one united nation under Yahweh, they split and there was Northern Israel and there was Southern Israel. There were 12 tribes. Y'all remember who the 12 tribes came from? Y'all talk back. Jacob. So it's Jacob's 12 sons who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are the tribes that step over the Jordan and they go into Canaan. They're the ones who occupy promised land. They're our great, 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 great. And then some spiritual grandmamas and granddaddies. Well, Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph, which means technically they aren't one of the 12 tribes. They're a half tribe. But do you know that after this, they're called a tribe? Technically, they're not a tribe, but they're called a full-on tribe. And when Israel splits, 10 tribes go to the north, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin go to the south where Jerusalem is. Do you know what they begin calling the north? Ephraim. The name Ephraim becomes a metonym for all the Israelites in the north. So he just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more prominent in Israel's history. But he's the second son. He's the spare. It's so cool, y'all. What this means for us as Christ followers, it means there's no second best. It means there's no JV. It means there's no lesser than. It means if you put your hope in Jesus, we're all favorites, every single one of us. He doesn't go, oh, you know what? It's, it's Thanksgiving up here in glory. You gotta sit at the kiddie table. 
Only the mature believers sit here. That is not biblically defensible. He goes, there is now no more hierarchy. You humans have hierarchy. You humans elevate certain ethnicities, certain socio-demographic groups, certain waist sizes, certain hair colors. You establish criteria for value. I don't. If you have put your hope in me, you're all favorite sons. Paul continues this theme. I just love this theme. He continues it in Romans 8. Romans 8 is basically the hub of our theological wheel. As believers, you know this. Romans 8, some of y'all have Instagrammed it, but you might not know it, know it. Romans 8, verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That's not a gender exclusive term, by the way. Paul goes on to explain later in Galatians 3, he says, if you are in Christ, there is now no more Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave nor master. So this is actually not a gender exclusive term. It's just in, in language at this time, it was a patriarchal society. So inheritance language was masculine, but that's not just talking about boys there. For all, that's the operative word. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the, received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Do you know Jesus is the first one in Luke 11 when he's teaching us how to pray? Prior to Jesus, the rabbis had really formal prayers and they would approach Yahweh, God the Father, with a title. Jesus says, no, you get to approach him as dad. Your sons, your firstborn, you get to approach him as dad, Abba, Father, Dad. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs, underscore that, y'all, fellow heirs. Your translation might say co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with, suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him. Colossians 1 tells us that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. He blows William, the Prince of Wales, away. <laughs> He's not just the firstborn in UK royalty. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the definitive heir, the definitive firstborn. And here Paul says, you're his co-heirs. You, raggedy, broke down, prone to chafe, prone to wander. People, you are co-heirs. The Greek term there is uh, sunkle ronomos. Sunkle rom romanos, it means we are properly entitled to inherit every single thing Jesus inherits. Properly entitled to inherit everything Jesus. Y'all, that should blow your doors. Properly entitled to inherit. So Jesus doesn't say, hey, dad, I've got a friend. I mean, I know they're kind of broke down. I know they're kind of ratchet, but you know, I got to know him in Charlotte. And can we just invite him in? I mean, they can stay like, they can stay in the basement. That's not it. We sit right next to Jesus at the banqueting table of God the Father. It's stunning. Our access is stunning. We're not less than adopted children. We're co-heirs. Missy and I were at a Christmas event uh, last year and uh, a man who has since become a friend, uh, a Messianic rabbi from Israel was at this event in Nashville. We were teaching him how to talk right and eat biscuits. And he, he watched Missy and I for a long time. And then he called me over and he said, Lisa, do you understand the distinction between adoption in America and adoption in a Jewish culture, especially a biblical Jewish culture? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, well, in, in my culture, and especially in the context of biblical narrative, a parent could disinherit a biological child, could disinherit a biological child. But it is illegal if you're an Orthodox Jew to disinherit an adopted child. 
He said, we don't even realize how significant it was when Joseph went with Mary to have the, the firstborn sacrifice made a week after baby Jesus was born. You read this in Luke 2. That's where Simeon sings over Jesus and says, this is the Savior. This is the man you have been waiting for all this time. That's where Anna, remember she was waiting there for almost 100 years. Simeon's old. I always imagine her back in the bathroom, like filling the paper, t- paper towel dispensers. And she knows Simeon. They're really close friends from the Jewish retirement home across the street from the temple. They're both big volunteers in the temple, been there for decades. And she hears Simeon warbling and she's back refilling the tape, paper towel dispenser and she thinks, oh no, he's broken his hip again. And she goes running or kind of wobbling into temple and she looks up and she see these, sees these teenagers and the boy has a pigeon squawking in his backpack. Mary and Joe were poor. They couldn't afford a normal sacrifice, so they brought a pigeon. And they've got a baby boy, and Simeon is holding this baby boy. And Simeon's face is lit up like a Christmas tree. And he says, this is the one. Anna, this is the one we've been waiting for all these years. This, this is the Christ. This is Emmanuel. My friend Samuel said, Lisa, when that happened, when Joseph voluntarily went to temple and said, this is my firstborn, what he was saying is, this one gets my full inheritance. Even though I'm technically the stepdad, I didn't get Mary pregnant. Technically, I'm the stepdad. This is my son. And every single thing I have, I'm given to this boy. He said, that's what we have When it says we're co-heirs with Christ, we're co-heirs with Christ. We get everything he gets. That is so hard for me to understand. It's become a little more tangible now that I'm a mom myself. I became a mom through the miracle of adoption the year I turned 50. I was uh, really broke down, probably all the chafing in my... (laughs) 20s and 30s, and and I was really afraid of intimacy. I didn't get married in my 20s and 30s. I was really drawn to abusers. God protected me from the men I was most drawn to. And this is, of course, pre-online dating, um, which that's been a train wreck for me too. I won't go there, but, (laughs) but the few good godly guys I dated, God protected them from me because I was just crippled with shame. Even though I knew Jesus, I knew him as my savior. I didn't know him as my liberator in my 20s and 30s. And so to, and by the way, when I hear babies, I love the sound of babies in church. Don't worry about a baby. When I see people in church give dirty looks to parents or grandparents or aunties or uncles with babies, I always pray the people giving the dirty looks would get hives because I'm like, Lord, have mercy if ever we should celebrate babies. But to get to have my story redeemed, to get to become a mom at the age of 50 through the miracle of adoption after my little girl's first mama died in Haiti, I I just, I feel like I'm still in the honeymoon season of how God restored that part of my story and getting to be Missy's mom. Getting to be Missy's mom has helped me understand more about being a child of God, head backwards to Luke's gospel. I love Luke's gospel. Luke is the only known non-Gentile author of scripture. He wrote the gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. And um, he was an outlier. He was not a Jew. All of the other authors of Holy Writ are, are Jews. We've got a few books that are formally classified as anonymous, but most of them were written by Jews. And so Luke, as a Gentile, knew what it was to, to wonder if he fit, that he actually didn't meet the minimum requirement for an author of a euangelion, a gospel. And so his stories are just riddled with compassion and with the idea of what it means to be close to this God who calls us his children And this story, this story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 11, you know, half of his sermon material was parabolic. It was story. This story he tells just slays me. Uh, Begins in verse five. He's taught them how to pray. And then Jesus said to them, he's talking to the disciples, 
Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. This is Luke 11, verse six. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him and he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, Again, if y'all are comfortable writing in your Bibles, underscore that one. That is such an interesting word. This too is a hapax legomenon. This is the only time this particular word is used anywhere in the Bible. The Greek of that English word is anadia. And it's this audaciousness. Uh, anytime you read about this in history, Josephus talks about it a lot. He was first century historian and he always uses it in the pejorative sense. So he says, because the neighbor is so audacious in his banging, the dad eventually rises and gives him what he needs. Verse eight, verse nine. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I grew up half Baptist. My mom is Baptist of the bone. My dad's Pentecostal. So I'm Baptocostal, which means I want to dance, but I have no rhythm. And... <laughs> I've seen almost all of these stories, flannel graft. I've heard that story in Luke 11. I bet I've heard that preached, oh, I don't know, Holly, a thousand times. You have too. I'm sure you've preached it before. I've seen it flannel graft. I mean, I thought I knew every nuance to that story, as horrifically arrogant as that sounds. And then in a seminary class, I'm finishing up a doctorate at Den Sim, I heard one of the, uh, he's considered the foremost authority on the parables, Dr. Craig Blomberg, preach on this particular passage. And I was just undone by his application. One of my other favorite theologians, living one anyway, I love all the dead guys, but Dr. Craig Keener is alive and kicking at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. And Dr. Craig Keener says this, if you get out of the Bible what you're expecting to get out of the Bible, you need to change your expectations. It's always bigger. It's always better. I thought that story in Luke 11 was about prayer. I thought it was about persistence in prayer because the takeaway is always ask, seek, knock. And Dr. Blomberg said, well, that, that's one of the applications, but you actually have to dig a little deeper and look at the parabolic semblance in this story. So anytime you have a dad in one of Jesus' stories or a master or vineyard owner, who does that represent? Always, always, young talk back. God, always. If it's a father in the story, Jesus always represents God, the father, master, always represents the king of all kings, always, always, always. So you've got a dad, he's in bed, he's asleep in his house. If you know anything about first century Jewish or, or Semitic architecture, you'll know they had one bedroom. So if you're asleep as a dad or as a mom or as a granddad or an uncle or foster parent, your kids are with you. They don't have separate bedrooms where they're playing PlayStation or texting naughty things. They, they don't have that. They're with you in that one sleeping room. So you've got the dad and then you've got the neighbor. And so the neighbor comes over because the neighbor wasn't prepared for a guest who comes to his house and didn't text ahead of time. And so he panics because he's got nothing in the pantry. He comes to the sleeping dad, bangs on the door and says, I need something, tortillas, you know, just anything, even those reduced fat triscuits, anything. I've got to have something because I don't have anything to put before this guy. That is unheard of in their culture. It's hospitable culture. You always had bread. So the thing I love about the Bible, because carbs are elevated in the Bible, which I think is a good thing. I think kale is just about from the devil. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, you always had bread. This guy's run out of bread. So he panics, he comes next door, he starts banging on the door. And when he's banging on the door, the dad goes, go away. I've already read the bedtime story. We've already had the water. We've already done everything. We are asleep. Go away. This is so rude. Anadia, he's audacious. But the guy's persistent because he's panicked. He just keeps banging on the door because he's like, I need something, a linguine, anything. 
I need something to give my guest. And it says, because of his impudence, the dad eventually gets up and gives him a snack for his guest. And then usually the application is, if you bang a little harder, God will answer. Y'all, that's not biblically defensible. It doesn't even go with the story. The stranger, Dr. Blomberg says, likely represents an unbeliever. Dad represents God. Where are we? Where are we? Are we outside banging or are we inside reclining right next to our dad? Y'all, this is less about prayer and it's more about proximity. It's less about us banging on the door. That doesn't bear out with theological logic. We don't have to beg God to act on our behalf. We're favorite sons and daughters. He loves us. On our worst day, we'll get discipline from our dad, but not discipline because he's a unibrowed librarian who's mad at us. We get discipline because he loves us. He's for us. Three years ago, Missy and I went from uh, Nashville to Kalispell, Montana. It was kind of toward the end of COVID. We were so excited to actually be leaving the house because, you know, during COVID, how you're not traveling much. And I travel a lot for work and I got so bored at home that I accidentally cut through my propane line with a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> It's actually not hyperbolic. I did, I almost killed us. Um, I'm single and old and my dad was a contractor. So I know my way around a power tool and I was buzzing this, this bush. And I thought, I just will do some landscaping. And I'm kind of a slow reactor and I smelled propane and realized, oh God, I just cut a propane line, almost killed us. So I thought it's good for us to get out of the house. And so I was thrilled when Levi and Jenny said, come up to Kalispell. They have a church called Fresh Life. And he said, come up, we'd love to, love to host you at Kalispell. And it took us a while to get there because you know that tail end of COVID, there weren't as many flights. And so we flew from Nashville to Chicago, a long way from Chicago, finally got to Kalispell, Montana. It was late in the afternoon, but I didn't have anything to do until the next morning. So I said, hey baby, you know, since we've been sitting forever, you wanna go, you wanna go stretch your legs? There's some great hiking trails around here. Missy said, no ma'am. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, I said, well, honey, they've, you know, they've got a lake right by the hotel and there's some canoes there. You want to get in the canoe and go for a canoe ride? No, ma'am. I was like, okay, well, um, we came through this darling little mountain village on the way to the hotel and there was a candy shop there and they've got ice cream and chocolate and all kinds of stuff. You, you want to walk up and get some candy at the candy shop? No, ma'am. And then I pulled out my piece de resistance. I, I, and my apologies if you build these or like these, but I, I just abhor hotel pools um, because I think they're just like big basins of bacteria. And so I, I love pools, but just not, you know, pools with that much strange flesh in it. And so I don't usually swim in the hotel pools. Missy loves hotel pools. So I kind of pulled the last trick out of my bag and I said, baby, do you wanna go swim in the hotel pool? There's like a big slide and everything. And she said, no, ma'am. It takes me a long time. I am not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I finally, after four flat refusals, realized I am getting on my child's nerves. You know, she, she was 11 at the time. She's just stepping into puberty. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not her hero anymore. I'm getting on her nerves. And so I said, honey, Am I getting on your nerves? And she said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and she said, is that disrespectful? I said, no, baby, that's not disrespectful. That's so normal. As a matter of fact, over the next few years, I'm gonna get on your last nerve. I, that's part of what growing up is. I said, that's not disrespectful, honey, that's just normal. So here's the deal. I'm gonna draw an imaginary line down this hotel room. And you get to stay on this side of the hotel room and you've got a little bit of homework. So you can do the homework on your iPad. And then after that, you can watch whatever you wanna watch. And then I'll stay on this side because I've got a little bit of homework too. And we can just stay on our, our separate sides of the hotel room. And if you need me, just call me, but I'll stay over here and I, I, I won't bug you anymore. And she said, yes, ma'am. And a couple of hours went by in that companionable silence. And then the sun went down. It was time for us to get ready for bed. And so we brushed our teeth. They had two sinks. 
And then we went to bed. They had two beds. Missy got in her little hotel bed and I got my little hotel bed. I turned out the light. Maybe 30 seconds passed. And then I heard my little girl. And she said, Mama, will you come over here and cuddle me? Because I don't think I'm gonna be able to go to sleep if you don't come over here and cuddle me. And I said, I'll tell you what you can do. You can climb out the window and you can get in the snow and you can walk through the snow and you can go to the concierge and you can ask the concierge if he'll bring you up to this floor and then you can knock on the door and if you bang really loud, then I might answer the door, but I'm not sure. Do y'all think that's what I did? When she said, I just need to get Pentecostal for a minute. Like I don't feel like I really preach unless I, the veins start poking out. And I did spit a little bit, Abby, just, just a little bit of spit. We call that anointing. I didn't yell. I didn't tell her she had to go outside and bang on the door when she said, Mama, will you come over here and cuddle me? Y'all, I leapt from my bed to hers and I brought snacks. I mean, this is my kid. This is my daughter. I will give her anything I have. And my love for my kid pales next to God's love for us. We forget that we're co-heirs. We forget that we're right next to him. We don't have to beg. He's for us not against us. One glance of your eyes, you've captured his heart. You don't have to put on matching t-shirts and drive a long way to be in the presence of your creator redeemer. He loves you. He loves you. He is a perfect, holy God. That means he's transcendent, but he condescends to be close to us He's a relational God. He's a father. And he says, you are my favorite. You're 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 my favorite. favorite." Hey, thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe. That way you can know when we go live and post new content. Make sure to leave me a comment. Let me know what spoke to you today where you're watching from and what we can pray for you about. And if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can click the Give button now and help us continue reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.